here this evening. I'm Georgette Howington, Contra Costa and Alameda County's coordinator, and I've been a Nest Fox monitor for 24 seasons. Oh. The California Bluebird Recovery Program averages over 16,000 successful pledges annually since 1996. We welcome you to learn about what we do, how, why, and assist you in starting your own trails or install backyard boxes. We may even be able to match you with existing trails that need to be adopted. Dick Blaine, our program director, is with us handling technical things. Tricia Jordan, our website manager and board member, posted your class content on the website under Getting Started, plus a lot more. We also have Michelle Unger, our San Francisco coordinator, and Beverly Cronin, San Mateo coordinators here tonight. Thanks to Carolyn Knight and Santa Clara Audubon Society for hosting. Please write your questions into the chat room. I'll do my best to answer as we go. We will answer the tough ones at the end. And the chat room is about in the middle of your screen at the bottom of your screen. Please stay muted and turn your camera off. Your mute uh, icon is on the far left and you'll see stop video. Please turn that off too. It's very distracting for the instructor. I offer personal coaching and my monitor partner of 17 seasons, Tom Gary, will be helping. We will do our best to keep the class to about an hour. There is a lot of information to cover, so we may run over. Keep in mind, this is an introductory course and we can't go into as much detail as we'd like. We will have resources at the end of the second lesson you have class content to refer to on the website, and we will offer personal coaching. Plus, county coordinators will help you in your counties. This course emphasizes monitoring bluebirds in bluebird boxes, but we do promote nesting for the other birds that use the same box. More about this later. The topics that we will cover are, why do bluebirds nest in nest boxes? features of a good nest box, predator guards, bluebird habitat, placement of nest boxes, monitoring your nest boxes, tools, backyard nest boxes, setting up a bluebird box trail, mounting your nest box, why keep data, challenges, and finally cleaning and repairing. Now I'd like to introduce you to your instructor. His name is Mike Azevedo, Santa Clara County Coordinator and also a board member. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to mention because uh, Georgette introduced you to the, uh, the, four, um, nest, the four county coordinators that are here, um, but there are a couple uh, more. Now some, we have people from several different counties um, including some of the ones that uh, that um, out a little bit further outside. One is uh, Sacramento, and your nest box coordinator is uh, Vicki Butler. And from Monterey County, your county coordinator is Amanda Priest. So um, we don't have county coordinators for Santa Cruz or uh, Marin County right now. If you're in San Joaquin County, I actually live in San Joaquin County, so although I'm not officially down as the San Joaquin County Coordinator, I, I basically could, I, I could be the County Coordinator there. And if you have any questions, you can always get a hold of me. Um, so let me get started um, because this is, a, a, this is a long training. And so I'm just gonna have to jump right in. Why do bluebirds nest in nest boxes? So let me, the first thing is that there are three different kinds of bluebirds um, in the United States. Uh, one is the Eastern bluebird, uh, the western bluebird and the mountain bluebird. And of course, the western bluebird and the mountain bluebird are the two kinds of bluebirds that you will find in California. Um, and as you can see, this is actually a nest that's laid in the ground. This is not a bluebird or a cavity nester of any kind, obviously. And the main reason that I put this slide in here is to point out that there are other birds that don't nest in nest boxes. Um, and so when we talk about uh, 
the the bluebirds that um, that need nest boxes, what they're doing is they nest in cavities, um, cavities uh, holes in trees, and uh, in this case, this one was made by a woodpecker. Uh, the woodpecker went ahead and made their own nest, whereas um, and then uh, the other so woodpeckers. Um, I'm very proud of these pictures. I took them both, but. Um, the, the reason that this is here, uh, woodpeckers are called primary cavity nesters. They can make their own nests. They, they, they do need some dead or dying trees. They don't, you don't want to have, uh, um, you, they're not going to be able to put their, their nests in really, really healthy trees. Um, and so, um, but they generally can take care of themselves. On the other hand, there are secondary cavity nesters. These are birds that are dependent on the primary cavity nesters, and uh, bluebirds are one of those. And in fact, there's about 20 uh, different birds that will nest in our nest boxes. When I say other nest boxes, I mean, you know, nest boxes of many different sizes. So um, now this is another, another example of a, uh, a kind of cavity that they might use. Now notice this stump here, um, there's a big, all the heartwood is rotted out. And the reason for that is because uh, the, well, the, hot, the heartwood is rotted out and that heartwood, um, that hole goes right up the center of the tree. And if a branch breaks off, that can expose that center, um, that center cavity. And even though the bottom of it is like on the floor, that's okay to the bird. They're okay with flying down through the middle of the tree to get down to the floor where they would build their nest. So um, obviously the babies would have to learn how to fly really well in order to fly up to the top up there, but that's a different kind of, uh, of cavity. And the thing about both of these cavities, those from woodpeckers, those from rot in the, the heartwood, is that those trees are not doing well. And people tend to be very concerned about those trees. And so what they'll do is they will go ahead and remove them. And uh, so they won't fall on people or property, things like that. So we are actually removing the nest box. Um, it's uh, removing the, the cavities that they use for the natural cavities, uh, their natural nesting sites. So um, obviously we are really doing a number on our environment and we go in and just you know wholesale knock all the trees, take out all the plant life, and that's really going to take out all of the habitat, right? Um, and uh, so if you turn a parking lot, a, a meadow into a parking lot, you're going to really be taking care of a lot of habitat. But that's not really entirely what's happening with uh, with the bluebird. The bluebird, it's it's if you think about habitat, habitat being everything an animal needs, which is food, water, shelter, space, the, the places to raise your young. What ends up happening is um, there are places that have everything that a bluebird could possibly want except for a place to raise their young. And when you have a habitat that is has all five components, all six components, whatever, all of those components except for one, you don't have bluebirds. And uh, the reason being that, you know, there's no way for them to reproduce. Doesn't matter how good the rest of the habitat components are. If you don't have the nesting sites, you don't have a place for them to reproduce. That is what's going on with the bluebirds. Luckily, we do have these nest box programs that are doing very well at bringing the bluebird back. Um, so this is a, a bluebird nest. Um, they, they, they look a little bit different depending on where you are because they work with whatever they have. You can see how coarse this grass is. Sometimes you find very fine nests used in, using very fine grass, or you even may find uh, nests out of pine needles. But um, whatever they've got, they're going to go ahead and make their nest, and then they lay blue eggs, usually. Every now and then you might find white eggs because there's something wrong with the pigment. But, um, but these are what you're gonna find when you're looking into a bluebird nest. Okay, and um, here's a bluebird female that's about to go into, this, uh, pic into the, uh, this nest box. And you're gonna see this picture a couple times because 
um, uh, there's, there's actually several things you can learn about, uh, about them from this picture. And um, even though that nest box is, is kind of old, obviously, it's, it's uh, a little bit worn. But one thing about it is, boy, is it the color of the bluebird. You know, um, the thing about these birds is that it's been a lot, oh, but now it says it's my internet is unstable. I hope that doesn't happen. Um, one thing about uh, the, uh, the bluebird is that, uh, or, or any of these cavity nested birds, they don't want you knowing where their young are because, um, bluebirds and all these birds are living in the wild kingdom. Their, their young are hunted 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they don't get any rest. And they need to make sure that no, nothing knows where their nest is. So the idea that you have a nest box that is not camouflaged, not doesn't allow them to camouflage, that's just wrong, right? But the bird houses that you find nowadays are just, you know, it, it can be really bad. It's unfortunate that so many awful birdhouse designs are out there, bright and colorful, not suitable for camouflage. The birds are easy to see as they enter and leave, which leads to a rise in predation. So the, um, what this is, is uh, over in San Jose, uh, there was an old amusement park called Frontier Village. And Frontier Village uh, was a, um, a Western themed amusement park. They had uh, uh, they had Wild West shootouts and canoe rides and things like that. And they had a lot of buildings that were there. And what they decided to do was um, the the the, the amusement um, Frontier Village actually closed in 1980. And uh, the but people were really nostalgic for that old park, and they decided that they would celebrate. Frontier Village by building birdhouses um, that looked like the buildings that used to be there. And as you can see, they're, they're beautiful as remembrance pieces. Um, but one thing about them is that they're all, every one of them is up on an eight foot pole out in the middle of a clearing and there's no way of opening them up to clean them out. So, um, and then the funny thing is they actually have a little sign at the bottom. And at the bottom of the sign, it says, uh, what kind of birds they expect are going to be using this nest box. Now, why they're doing this is because they think that all it takes to, for example, attract a downy woodpecker is to have a box that uses the proper dimensions and entrance hole size of a downy woodpecker. But that's not necessarily true. It, it takes an awful lot of specific placement and, um, and, and other things in order to get a downy woodpecker to move in. And we don't have, we have hardly any downy woodpeckers as an example, um, moving into our nest boxes anywhere in the state. Yes, we do find them now and then, but it's very rare. And the idea that, that you would find them in, a play, in, in this particular case, it, it's just really unrealistic. White-breasted nuthatches, the next bird there, um, are very secretive birds that do not like flying across a, a, a clearing to get to their nest. And the Western bluebird needs a lot of grassland around. So if there's not a lot of grassland in the area, you're not necessarily gonna have Western bluebirds. House wrens like thickets nearby. So you're not necessarily gonna have house wrens moving in there. And chestnut back chickadees like to have a canopy overhead and there's no canopy over these uh, nest boxes that are all put in the clearings. Basically, none of the birds that, we, that are expected to be using these nest boxes are gonna be there. And worse, worse yet, if they do have um, any birds that are using them, there's no way of cleaning them out, which means that they're gonna fill up with straw and poop. And uh, so it's just, it just doesn't work. So um, it, it, that's one of the reasons I'm doing this training is to let everybody know that uh, we want to try and help the, the birds um, find what they need. And, and even a lot of times people will say, well, now, wait a minute, I have a nest box that has, it's painted bright colors and has neon lights wrapped around it. And it has an entrance hole size large enough for a crow to go in. And I said, well, I, I would say to them, um, and, and they say, and I got eggs 
in there. And the reason they go, they would have gotten eggs is because those birds are desperate to nest somewhere. They really want to reproduce. But uh, the question is, did it succeed? Getting eggs is not success. Having the birds um, hatch and then fledge, that is success. That's when you know the nest box worked. But it, it doesn't really matter that you get eggs in the nest box because all that proves is that the birds really needed to go somewhere. Okay, the features of a good nest box. Now, um, a lot of people ask us, well, where can I get a nest box? Because they're not comfortable making their own nest box. Um, there are several places you can get them. Um, there are specialty uh, food store, feed stores like for, um, for bird feeding. And uh, for example, Wild Birds Unlimited or Los Gatos Bird Watcher. Um, both of those stores, uh, the people inside know their way around nest boxes. Um, and that, that, that's good because the hardware stores, unfortunately, that's not generally the case. And, um, and especially in hardware stores, you're not going to find great nest boxes. Um, and then you might find something online. But the main thing is that no matter where you go, and that includes going to the Audubon Society or to Los Gatos Bird Watcher, you really want to pick up the nest box and look and see what you've got. You want to know that it can open. You want to know that it is well built and sturdy and that all the different parts um, that I'm going to talk about are there because unfortunately, many of the commercially available nest boxes just are not very good. Um, so one of the things we, you need to be able to do is open your nest box. It's important to be able to look in and know what's going on inside there. Know if, uh, if there are any problems, know if uh, the predators have struck, know how many eggs you've got, or if you, you know, where this, where your nesting is in the cycle of, uh, of, of nesting um, to know, and then be able to clean it out. Um, be, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, so this one, notice it is actually opening on the side. If you look over on the right side of the nest box there, you can see the entrance hole. So this one opens on the side and notice that it opens upward um, from, so it pivots toward the top of the nest box. And then this one opens from the front. So it pivots upward from the front. So though these are uh, things to, to note. Um, and then this one opens uh, again from the side, but it pivots from the bottom, not from the top. And uh, so the, the reason, it, it obviously, like I said, it's really important to be able to open the nest box at all. There are also some that open from the top. Now we don't recommend the ones open from the top, although they are really good for taking pictures of what's going on inside, but they're very hard to clean out. Um, the ones that open from the side, we figure are a little bit better. Now, the thing about the one from the front, that they open from the front, I don't think there's anything really wrong with that nest box. It's quite usable. They've fledged many thousands or tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of birds. Um, and I don't even know that there is a difference in the success rate that you would have from a, a front opening box to a side opening box. But think about it. You're a mother bird and you're sitting on the nest inside the box and the side opens up. Now you're used to coming in and out from that hole up there. So you look over and, and the entire wall has disappeared, but you know where you're gonna escape. You're gonna escape out that hole, right? But what if the front opens up and basically the hole disappears? Now, what do you do? Well, now you really have no way of escaping. So you're gonna be much more nervous and you and the monitor who's just opened this may get a bird in the face. So um, as you can see, there are advantages to the side opening nest box. Um, another thing is some of the, the predator guards we'll talk about, they just don't work with uh, front opening nest boxes. You really need a side opening nest box. So for, for there are a couple of reasons why side opening nest boxes are better. Okay, you also want an overhang. Overhangs are important because uh, they, they help guard against rain and they can actually save lives when it comes to like a cat sitting up on top, reaching around, trying to get their paw inside. A little bit more of an overhang means that paw doesn't go quite as far in and it's a lot harder for them to predate the nest box. Uh, dimensions are important. You don't want it too big, you don't want it too small. 
as you can imagine, you got five or six babies in there and they're all learning to fly and flapping their wings in each other's faces. So you don't want it too small because boy, that's gonna get really awkward. However, you don't want it too big either you, because if it's too big, it could catch wind, um, more wind, and it could also uh, make be more prominent and easier for the predators to see. Uh, it needs to be durable. Um, in fact, raccoons can rip these nest boxes apart. And when I say, um, and it's not like uh, it's um, like they they uh, they they can be fairly sturdy and they can still rip it apart. So you don't want to give them any help. Um, you want the nest box to at least last through the entire nesting season, and you definitely want um, it to be able to withstand a little bit of abuse. Um, ventilation and drainage. Now. Um, the, this is the floor of the nest box. And if you look over at the triangles on the corners of the nest, nest box, the way those are made is when they actually made the, the floor of it, they kind of just cut off the corners. Okay, and um, that may seem, first of all, those may seem like they're really large for uh, uh, the drainage holes. They're not. Um, the, remember that the the mother bird is going to go in there and or the father and they're going to actually cover it in straw. So you, um, and there's nothing's going to fall through them um, because the, uh, they're going to be blocked up with straw and things like that. However, um, they're large enough that they're not going to get in instantly clogged. So um, now some people do drill holes in them. They would have to be large holes though, because if they're, if they're too small, then uh, they're, like I said, they're going to get easily clogged up. So um, I like having them on the corners. I think that's where most of the water would kind of end up naturally going. So this is the best way to do drainage. And then ventilation is also important. And a lot of, a good place to put the ventilation is right up along the, the ridge of the ceiling. Um, some people obviously drill uh, holes for drainage. So uh, I'm sorry, for ventilation. Um, and one thing you do is put screen in there too to prevent anything from going in through the uh, through those um, those uh, drained those ventilation holes put in the top of the nest box. Uh, entrance hole is very important. You want it big enough, obviously, for the species of bird you expect to go into the nest box, but you don't want it any bigger than they are. You literally want them to be able to just eat, squeak through. And you don't want anything bigger than they are to go in. Um, so we'll we'll play uh, um, something later on where we're talking because the um, the western bluebird likes an inch and a half size hole for their nest box uh, entrance hole, and um, unfortunately the house sparrow also likes an inch and a half size hole, and that's a problem because those are vicious introduced birds that don't belong here, and they will break eggs, they'll kill young and they will even kill adult native birds. So that's a problem. Um, if you have a nest box for a chestnut back chickadee, you can use an inch and a quarter size hole. And uh, by doing the using an inch and a quarter instead of an inch and a half, you exclude the house sparrow. So uh, the Western bluebird has to compete directly with the house sparrow. The chestnut back chickadee, oat tip mouse, uh, many of those other birds don't. Um, curves are like a little ladder. And uh, this is one of Lee Pauser's boxes. And what he does is he scores uh, on the side of a piece of wood, and then he actually glues it right underneath the inside of the nest box, right underneath the hole. And um, now the reason for these is because when you have a natural cavity that a, a bluebird or any bird that's in there is gonna be using, Remember that those are really rough hewn. I mean, they 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 gone in there and they created it with their beaks, and um, even if they've rotted out, they're going to be kind of rough and have lots of toe holds and places for a bird as it's fly, flapping its wings trying to get up to the to the uh, hole. It's going to be able to do that and get a toe hold. Well, you can't do that inside of a nest box because it's sheer and there's simply no toe holes at all. Well, um, most of our uh, native birds, frankly, seem to be able to get by without curves, but not all of them, because the white, uh, the the violet green swallow 
has its legs way down on the bottom of its of its body. If they're further down, and it's harder for them to get up to the the entrance hole. They really need curves, and so there are some species that that really need the curves. And so a good nest box is going to have curves. Now, once again, um, we're coming back to this picture because there's no perch on this nest box, right? And if you look at the way the bluebird is holding on to that nest box, uh, it doesn't need a perch. It's holding on to the bottom of the hole and it just thrusts itself right through. So the only thing that a perch is going to help is house sparrows and predators. It, there's just no reason to have a perch. In fact, they're bad. Don't put a perch on your nest box. Um, and then they have to be lockable. Now, there's a couple of different ways to, to be able to lock your nest box. The one on the left here is uh, just a Phillips head screw. And the cool thing about that is that um, if you have a nest box is kind of out where people are walking around, uh, if you actually are able to screw that down and, um, and close it with this screw, then only people with screwdrivers are gonna be able to get into the nest box. And most people don't carry screwdrivers while they're hiking around. So that's generally a good way of securing the nest box. The one on the right is actually kind of a bent nail style of a twisty uh, uh, lock. And um, it's fine if, for example, you have a hanging nest box that most people are never gonna be able to get their hands on anyway, or if it's on private property. So um, those are two different ways of being able to secure the nest box closed. And then coloration. Now I, I already talked about camouflage and how important it was, but I do need to talk about coloration in general because um, although, uh, you know, unfortunately having a nest box that is a natural color like this is not always gonna be possible. Um, and uh, we do have people, it's a good idea to color them. For example, if you're gonna paint them, go ahead and paint them a, a, a light color. Now, um, some people use a white color, but uh, which is good for, you know, keeping it cool inside. But if you think about it, that's going to be make it very easy for them to not to, uh, it's not going to make it very easy for them to blend in. And so one way to do it is, for example, paint the rest of the nest box white and in the front where they have to go in anyway, paint that a more um, neutral color that they're able to blend in with better. Okay, another way to do it is to light, have you light brown, light blue, or um, other, some other natural looking color that is easier to blend in. And like I said, you can, you can do something that allows them to, um, to blend in really well. The, uh, there's a reason why the, the female is a little more drab is because she needs to be able to blend in pretty well. Um, insulation value. Now, uh, I have a, uh, a picture I'm going to show you in a second, um, but it's, we, we recommend a three quarter inch if you can. Not all of the nest boxes that we, that we even call really good nest boxes have three quarter inch wood. Um, some of them have just half inch wood, um, but many of those nest boxes are used under the canopy of a tree. And if they're under the canopy of a tree, then they don't have to be quite as good at holding their insulation in. Um, but uh, but uh, insulation value is very important. And um, this is actually a, uh, my, my wife's uncle actually found this, uh, this nest um, in the middle of a tree and he was taking the tree down. So he went ahead and actually, uh, no, this is, it was hollowed out actually by the woodpecker. So this is what a natural cavity is going to look like. And look at the thickness of those walls. Okay, when you compare it to a regular nest box, you realize just how thick those walls are. And that's why um, nest boxes are not as good as natural cavities. Um, so when you are trying to make a, a nest that is going to be out in the hot sun, keep that in mind. We have a couple of different things that we are, are talking about, you know, using coloration or even maybe having a gapped roof over the top in order to try and prevent it, but to protect it from the hot sun. This is a plastic birdhouse. So if you think that I'm, uh, that I'm uh, making too big a deal out of the fact that you need insulation value, um, it's just ridiculous. This is not right. 
that people make plastic birdhouses. And when you think about how the, the, pops, the, the temperature fluctuation inside, if it's in the middle of the hot sun, um, it's just, oh, it's horrible to just think about a nest inside of this thing. Um, and then what kind of wood would you use? Now, of course, see, everybody hears about cedar being used for nest boxes because that's what they use over in the east. But anybody who's gone into our, uh, our um, lumber yards around here knows that cedar is not readily available around here. So um, redwood is probably the best word to use around here. Now, um, one of, the, uh, one of our, our best nest box monitors uses plywood pretty much exclusively, and he recommends the use of plywood. Um, and uh, so if you're gonna do that, remember that many times I've always heard plywood, um, people talk it down as a, a something for a nest box because they're afraid about chemicals and the chemical um, inside um, chemical. So what you wanna do is make sure and sand it down really well inside the nest box. Um, so that we don't have any chemical um, residue inside the nest box. Um, if you're going to end up using pine, uh, I'm sorry, plywood. And then pine, the, the, the biggest, I guess, issue for pine is that uh, it, it just is not, doesn't last as long. Um, however, uh, and then the woodpeckers love pine. So if you want woodpeckers, whoops, if you want woodpeckers, it's good to use pine. <laughs> Um, I actually have a couple of pine nest boxes. They were made by accident because I wasn't the one who made them. They were made by some school kids and, uh, and uh, the, the woodpeckers moved right into them. So, um, you know, I like woodpeckers and I have no problem having woodpeckers in a couple of my nest boxes. So, um, but keep that in mind. It's a nice soft wood. It's easy to chew into. And so the woodpeckers love it. So you're constantly going to be having to repair it if you aren't actually just leaving it for the woodpeckers. Um, and then predator guard. So um, the idea behind a predator guard is some something to kind of a locked door between the uh, the thief and the uh, the goods that you're trying to protect, right? And in this case, it's something called a knoll guard. It's made out of wire. Um, it's kind of a wire mesh. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you the plans for this in a minute. But what's cool about it is that um, if you're a snake that's coming up. Um, you know, you see that, that hole there, but how do you get up there? You know, it's not necessarily easy for them to find their way around to get inside and raccoons, if they get up there now, unfortunately they can, if it's not, if you're not careful and keep it really sturdy, they'll be able to, they might be able to, to really destroy that, um, that null guard, but at least, uh, it, it does tend to work against many different kinds of predators, um, avian predators like birds, um, jays, things like that. They can't get up there. So, um, and believe it or not, the bluebirds can. They land right inside that little tunnel. They hop over and they hop right in. So um, a knoll guard is one kind of predator guard. Another one is a stovepipe baffle. Now, a stovepipe baffle kind of operates the same way as far as, uh, for, especially for snakes. And snakes are one of our most common predators. So the snake sees the hole from a distance. He comes up and he says, I'm going to go up there. And he starts going up the pipe, up the, uh, the pipe to get up there. And he goes, he generally will go inside the stovepipe. Well, the top of the stovepipe, you can't get any further up. It's like a dead end. And so he gets defeated. He, he, he they lose interest, hopefully at some point, and they come back down. So stovepipe baffle. And this is actually um, available on our website and it is actually the plans on how to make both a stovepipe baffle and the knoll guard. Um, so if you have any questions on it, you know, do let us know. But, um, but this, this is available and they are great. Now there's one thing about it. It's only usable um, on the, the stovepipe baffle is only usable on a pole mounted nest box. So I'm gonna talk about other kinds of mounting of nest boxes. Um, some of them you can't use a, uh, a stovepipe baffle on. Okay, and a wood guard. Now this is just a two by four um, that was cut, put the drill hole, the hill, drill the hole through, and you can put 
the uh, put it up there and the birds don't mind using it like a little tunnel and they just go right through. But from a standpoint of a predator, especially one that can't quite fit into the box, like a jay or a, uh, um, or a, a cat trying to get its paw in there, the more wood between the predator and the babies, the better. So, um, so that's a wood guard. Um, now these are plastic guards and unfortunately, uh, and, and we don't have much experience with plastic guards and we also don't have much faith in them just because they're very light. They, they look, I don't know that they wouldn't uh, work, but um, because they kind of use the same general principle as the wood, the big thing is why wouldn't you use one of the others? Why wouldn't you use a knoll guard? Why wouldn't you use a wood guard? You know, this plastic guard here just doesn't seem to me like it's as uh, sturdy and durable as it needs to be, um, given that it's going to be used constantly. Um, and then this is not really a, a, guard, a predator guard. It's more of a plate protector. And the idea is that it protects against woodpecker damage. And if that's what you want to do, you know, you can do that. A lot, you see a lot of nest boxes that have a little protector on there. And they do have their purpose because you don't want to have um, the, um, the woodpecker opening it up. Now, um, if I do have a woodpecker open it up, what I do is I put a larger piece of wood on there with the regular hole drilled in there and I can just go ahead and close the hole back up. It's not like, as long as you're watching for problems with these woodpecker, um, woodpecker holes, you should be, you should be fine. Uh, so bluebird habitat, um, bluebird habitat, I told you what habitat is basically, bluebirds actually like ground dwelling insects and they usually get that from grass, um, grassland, okay? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what goes with the grassland later on, but I wanna talk about bird brain priorities. If you're a bird and you are moving into an area, what is the first thing you're gonna look for? What is the first component of habitat you're going to look for that would be food okay the reason food is so important is because that's really the hardest thing you're going to be looking for right um and you're not looking for what's going to happen now you're looking for what's going to happen in a month you're not going to have to feed any babies for two weeks and then when you when the babies first hatch they're small and they don't need that much food but in a month from now you're gonna to need to be feeding a lot of food. And so you're gambling on what's life gonna be like in a month as far as the insect population, which is what you're gonna be feeding your babies, right? That is what they're looking for. So they're gonna come in and they're gonna look for food. Once they find a place with good food, then they're gonna say, ah, now I wanna find a house. Now I wanna find a place to raise my young. And they're gonna look around and that's why they're looking for uh, a place to, to live now. Okay, um, so that's bird brain priorities. Um, now the, the nest box placement, um, I, I mentioned uh, grassy ha habitat, but you also wanna have some trees around if you can. Now I've seen plenty of, of uh, bluebirds away from trees and things like that, but we'll talk about why trees are a great thing to have around your, your habitat. An open oak and coniferous woodland habitat is really what um, what the original bluebird habitat looked like, you know, um, especially with the the snags, some of the the trees that are older and not doing so well, they make for great nesting. Um, and then oak is a keystone species, and what that means is if you ever seen, uh, I don't know if you see this book right here, uh, the Nature of Oaks by uh, Doug Ptolemy. Doug Ptolemy um, calls oaks one of the most important trees you're ever gonna find. Because here in the United States, all of the, there's all kinds of different kinds of oaks, but in general, oak trees provide uh, habitat, the hosting duties for hundreds of different kinds of caterpillars. And caterpillars are a very important food source for any bird that's trying to feed their, their, babe, their young. Um, because 95% of birds feed insects to their young, okay? 
so oak trees are one of the best providers of habitat like that. Um, another one is willow and, uh, and so various other ones, but they also have to be native trees. So if it's not a native tree, don't expect it's gonna be providing much habitat. Okay, uh, let's talk about nest box placement. Now, um, first of all, what kind of places might be good for uh, putting your nest box? Well, um, obviously we're gonna talk about uh, what goes on in your backyard, but parks and vineyards and cemeteries, golf courses, farms, schoolyards, corporate campuses, open spaces, anywhere that they do not use insecticide um, would be good for, uh, for habitat, okay? And I like this uh, Lee Pauser quote um, that he uh, mentioned that when you put up a nest box, it's kind of like fishing. Now, you know, if you go fishing in a pond, right? If there are fish in that pond, you might catch something. If there are no fish in their pond, I don't care how long you fish, you're not going to catch anything. If there's no birds in the neighborhood, nothing is going to move into your uh, nest box. And certainly if there's no cavity nesting birds, you're not going to get anything in that nest box. The, no native birds, you're going to get no native birds in that nest box. So um, it's important to keep that in mind because a lot of people are always, you know, I put a nest box in my backyard and nothing ever moved into it and they're all upset. Well, if there's nothing in your neighborhood, that's one of the secrets is you need to have the birds in your neighborhood for them to find your box. It makes sense, right? Um, the case of Monterey County's Asilomar. It turns out that Asilomar has not really had bluebirds around it for like 90 years. And once they started putting in nest boxes, and it, it probably took some time for them to find them, but now they have now they have bluebirds. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that I'm not trying to discourage you for putting up nest boxes. Sometimes it's all that is really needed in order to get the the birds there. But they need to um, you need to find uh, you need to have um, the the it, it they're going to be coming through looking for places to raise young, and if they don't find them, then they have to keep moving. Um, and then what are snags? Snags are like a dead tree. Now, I think this is a dormant tree. This is just a dormant tree. But uh, a snag is going to look a lot like it. Basically, it's going to be a tree without leaves. And um, that's kind of what nest boxes are supposed to emulate. Um, and then uh, I've got this. Now, what I'm going to talk about here is canopy. Because although bluebirds don't always need canopy to nest in, what they do need is, uh, oh, well, they, they are good with nesting in canopy, and, uh, under a canopy, under the canopy of a tree. And why this is good is because, especially with climate change and it's getting hotter and hotter, under a canopy is gonna be cooler. And that's a great thing. You want it to be cooler. So, um, so if um, now a nest, we're, we're going to, uh, I'm not actually going to be talking about what to do. And I mentioned that or earlier that if you put a gapped kind of a, a second roof on top with a little gap between it and the first roof, then um, you kind of create like a shade in the middle and that might kind of operate a lot like a uh, canopy, but there are going to be other reasons I'll talk about um, trees and why you'd want them in the, in the habitat. So this is box direction. If you think about it, um, I, 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 want, I used to tell people not to worry about where to point your nest box, but the main thing you don't want to point at is the wind and the rain. So um, there's a lot of directions. If, you, if you're not worried about going, you don't want to point it directly at the rain or directly at the wind. As long as you're pointing it anywhere else, you should be fine. Um, some of the larger nest boxes, it's more important where you point the nest box because their holes are bigger and they allow in more rain. These holes are smaller. If you have a good overhang, then you should be fine as long as you don't point it directly at the rain. Okay. <clears throat> and then another thing they talk about, if you look, if you, if you pretend you're the, the little baby bird and you're looking out, what do you see? Do you see safety? Because trees and bushes um, that are maybe 50 yards away 
um, can be a good place to fly to. And the reason you want them there is because you don't want their first flight to be their last flight. You want them to be able to fly to safety. So you're a baby bird who doesn't, isn't real comfortable with your flying. You want to have a place to go, right? If you look out there, you don't know where you're going, then you're going to be kind of timid. And that's not what you want when you're taking that first flight. Um, and then uh, when you are, have your nest box, you want it to have a good, clear entrance. Now, that probably was the case when this uh, wood duck box was first put in, but it's been a while and the, the uh, undergrowth around it has grown up around it. And now it's got stuff right next to it. And that's a problem because if you're a parent bird and you're coming up, you don't want to find a, a surprise in the way of a cat or another predator sitting right next to the nest box that was hidden by all this brush. So you want to keep that entry nice and clear, okay? And that goes double for what's right in front of it, because as you can see, uh, the, uh, the, this apparently nobody's been maintaining in front of these nest boxes. And then human activity. Now, uh, human activity is uh, something, if you think about, what, what if you have a nest box hanging up in one of these trees right here? Well, that's a problem, right? Because all these people are just kind of hanging out there and you're not going to want to feed your babies with all of these people hanging around, right? Well, you can kind of foresee this, right? So you want to look where the human activity is and where it isn't. You want to put the nest box where there isn't so much activity. Um, for example, if you put a nest box in your front yard, right where you walk to the car every day, you know you're going to be interrupting the birds Whereas if you put it in your backyard where maybe you don't go out all that often, it's going to be much easier on the birds. So you want to put them where there isn't that much human activity. And then um, this is another one of Lee Pauser's uh, photos. Uh, he happened to be walking along and he sees his barn owl box and a bobcat sitting on top of it. Now, um, I wanted to just talk about cats, but this is actually the situation I wanted to talk about because a cat can often find its way on top of your nest box, right? Um, when you're putting in a nest box, you want to know what, do you have feral cats in your yard? Do you have your own cats in your yard? Um, what are the chances that cats are going to be attacking your nest box? And if you know that there are cats in the yard, do what you can to make it hard on the cats, you know? Um, don't put the nest box in such a way that a cat can easily hop from the top of a fence or something like that onto the nest box. Try and you may need to raise it up a little bit in order to get it further away from the cat, you know? Um, so, um, and then make sure you have a good long overhang and do whatever you can, put a good knoll guard on it, things like that. Um, if you've got cats, then you should do something to try and uh, help the birds get, um, get uh, survive them, okay? And then, unfortunately, the presence of house sparrows. House sparrows have been around since the, the, uh, the 1800s, actually, um, and certainly 1900s. <clears throat> they were introduced. Um, they are uber competitive. They have four broods every year, or they can, whereas our native birds have one, and every now and then two, very, very rarely three um, different broods. And so the house sparrows just, they really outcompete and they're vicious and they kill adult uh, native birds and they kill the, the young and the, the um, eggs and they can get into bluebird nest boxes. We do not want to encourage them. And you want to be um, watching for house sparrow nests. Um, Lee Pauser has, a, uh, has some information on how to <clears throat> discourage house sparrow nests on our website. You can look, look that up or you can find them on cialis.org. Um, and then are pesticides used nearby? Now, um, insecticides are obviously one of the, the worst things you can have um, because if it's going for insecticides, then they're spraying the insects, right? But even, unfortunately, herbicides will kill the babies. Um, they, they dry out the insects, but then if a mother bird goes and picks up an insect that's covered in herbicide and feeds it to a young, then you're going to end up killing off all of the babies. And unfortunately, I have found entire nests of dead babies. 
and we know it's probably was because somebody sprayed herbicide or insecticide and it got it was fed to the babies fed to the young um cattle are obviously you know <clears throat> they're not going to eat the babies or anything like that but what they could do is rub up against a pole nest box and push it over so that's something to keep in mind if you have cattle around you want to be careful um that the the nest box is able to handle um having cattle around and then mowing and construction so um when you're installing a nest box trail and you know you're going to be putting it someplace like a corporate campus or anywhere where they're going to be mowing especially mowing frequently you want to make sure you are trying to be as kind to the management as possible because they're being kind to you by allowing you to, to put your nest box up there you want to make sure you don't put it where the mowing crew is going to hit it on their head every time. Um, and if there's construction, you also want to check. You want to double check to make sure there's no construction that's going to be happening near the nest box because the construction project might be halted if it turns out your nest box has an active nest in it. Unfortunately, we've done that before where we had a nest box up there and there was supposed to be construction started and had to wait three weeks while the babies um, ended up uh, were, were fed. We didn't, they didn't want to take any chances. And so we could have avoided that if we had simply not installed the nest box when we knew construction was happening. Um, you take it down and put it back up later You can put it somewhere else. Just make sure not to put it right next to where the construction is happening. Um, Mike, then how far apart? Mike, yeah. five minutes, five okay. minutes. Thank you very much. Um, how far apart are you going to have your nest boxes? So um, as you can see, these, these um, nest boxes are actually back to back. Now, you don't want to have two nest boxes that are very close and looking at each other. But if you actually have them so they're not looking at each other, in this case, they're actually back to back. Um, what you can do is that it's called pairing. And the way that paired nest boxes work is um, you're not going to have, for example, two bluebirds nesting there they're too competitive for that um they they go for the same they feed literally the same food to their babies they do not want uh, another bluebird right next to their nest box but the there are other birds such as tree swallows and violet green swallows that routinely um will take the other nest box so uh you'll have a bluebird in one box these ground dwelling insects and a swallow that eats flying insects, they don't compete with each other, but you know what they do do? Neither one of them likes predators around their nest box, around their nest. And if they see a snake crawling up the same pole or even within 15 feet, they will, all four birds attack that snake or whatever it is that they see. So that means just double the trouble for any predators that are trying to attack a nest box up here, okay? So a paired box is one that's within 15 feet of the other um, of the other nest box, okay? Um, and then you want, now I, I've heard unfortunately different things. I, I've, I've heard so many different measurements. Uh, some people say 100 feet, others say 100 yards and others say 200 yards. So what we know is that we have the, the two different kinds of bluebirds in California. One is the Western bluebird, the mountain bluebird. Bound bluebirds are a little bit bigger. They need a little bit more food. And so um, they require more space. And so they require about two to 300 yards. Um, and uh, according to um, the same sources, Western bluebirds require one to 200 yards. Now the thing about it, like I said, 100 feet, in many cases, 100 feet is all you really need. And I've actually got um, boxes that are closer than that. And wh why, why do you think there's a difference? The difference is um, the insect load, how much, how, how much food there is in a smaller area. Because um, I've got nests that are right next to horse pasture that lots and lots of insects. And so the, uh, the, the insect, the, uh, the birds have um, all kinds of, um, of food to feed their babies and they don't have to be as territorial. So they can have smaller hunting grounds and they don't have to worry about um, having birds quite so close together. And then other birds and other habitats, um, 
there are going to be, I, I, there are about 20 different birds that they use different kind of nest boxes. Um, and uh, they, they have make different nests. They all look different. Um, and uh, I am going to try and do a lot more about putting information on our website uh, about different kinds of cavity nesting birds. Normally, I talk a little bit about each one um, in my training, but I'm not going to do that this time. I'm going to really stick to bluebirds. So, um, but these are tree swallow eggs right here. And you see the feathers. That's something that you didn't see in the bluebird nest. So, um, so we're going to have more information on other birds. And I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Um, and so we'll start with uh, monitoring your nest box and, you know, why you do that and stuff like that next time. So, uh, Georgette, um, do you uh, do you have any uh, questions that you wanted to talk about? No, I think uh, I think uh, uh, we're good. I, I no, we're fine. I was able to answer all the questions, so we're good. Well, I see I see Beverly turned her camera on. Hi, Beverly. <laughs> um, Beverly is our uh, San Mateo County coordinator. Um, so, if you um, are from San Mateo County. Uh, you um, you would be uh, part of uh, the, the Sequoia Audubon Society has their own cavity nester recovery program. And, and I should mention also Santa Clara County has a cavity nester recovery program. And they're both run through the respective Audubon societies. Santa Clara is Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. And um, Beverly's program is run through the Sequoia Audubon Society. So if anybody has any, uh, wants to get a hold of the San Mateo County coordinator, you could probably just type it in chat and uh, we'll make sure Beverly gets your information. Um, and then, uh, or you can go on, actually, do you want to turn your uh, mic on and let us know uh, where they might be able to go, the San Mateo County people? I actually posted it in the chat. I can repost okay. it again in case somebody joined late because they wouldn't be able to see that. Uh, do you want to just go and copy and just paste yeah. it again, just to sure. make sure they see it. Yeah. And, um, and so, but um, we're going to be back work. on Friday for part two. And I know that there are going to be some Sacramento people. There might be some Sacramento people in the audience. And, um, and so uh, we're actually going to be giving this talk. There's no point in, in seeing it all over again, because um, we're going to be giving this talk on the 20th to the, San the Sacramento Audubon Society. And, um, and then... Uh, on Friday, we're going to have part two of uh, what of this training. So uh, anyway, um, well, uh, I think we went over what was what's going to what's going to be on there. So um, if there's no more questions, uh, it looks like we were able to get it all done in an hour. So um, thank you, everybody, for coming. And I hope to see you on Friday. And uh, we are recording this. It will be available, um, or, or actually one of them will be available. We have to figure out which recordings we're going to actually post somewhere. But um, actually, this one's being recorded by Carolyn. So I guess Carolyn has the uh, has the the uh, um, is going to tell us where this one is. This going to be posted on the Santa Clara Valley website? Yeah, or this is going to go up on our YouTube channel and um, on our website under our Cavity Nesters uh, page. So. Excellent. Okay, so um, I know that we had all these different people that were uh, that were signed up for it, and for those who were not able to make it, they'll be able to look at to see the recorded version of it. All right. Oh, well. Dick, Dick wanted to mention that all of this information is on our website. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, again, thank you everybody for coming and uh, we'll see you on Friday. See you.